Hello and welcome to the Portland Film Festival. Um, I am here to speak with uh, Steve Mikesell. I was wanted to make sure I said your name correctly, Mikesell, um, about his film Unearthing Agawa. Did I say that correctly too? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to take a moment to thank uh, some of our sponsors. First of all, we want to thank um, Comcast. Comcast has been a supporter of the film festival for four consecutive years now. Um, their ongoing support ensures that diverse voices are given a platform to share their unique perspective in the world. We'd also like to thank Kerner Camera, Portland Mortgage, and Oregon Film. To find out more about the film we're going to talk about today and other films, you can go to pdxff.com. So this is a Q&A, so everyone has kind of seen the film, so we can kind of dive right into things. So um, this is a, such a unique story, it's kind of hard to know what what layer to peel off of the onion first. But um, I guess my first question for you is, I, I recall in the in the film, you said, your dad didn't speak of this diary that he had found. Um, and in 1958, I believe is when it was returned. So when did your awareness of this, this diary come into play? And what was this? How did, how did you discover it, it existed? It was uh, later in his life, um, I began and I think it's probably pretty common when people's parents become older, uh, you begin to ask questions while you still can. And so I was just casually interviewing my father um, about his life. And uh, he had a really fascinating life, but he was also very empathetic. Just a, probably most people would say he's one of the nicest guys you ever met. Um, and so um, I was just really curious because he had some hard knocks early in life and things like that. And how did he retain that kindness and how did he, uh, manifest that through all of his decades. Um, and then in the course of what, in which, you know, I was asking about his different life experiences, one of which was World War II. And like a lot of men and women that served in World War II, they didn't talk about it a lot when they came home. It's very common that they just sort of, especially if they saw hard action and things, they kind of clammed up and they just wanted to get back to having life and trying to have good things happen again in their lives, especially if they saw bad things. Um, but um, he opened up a little bit and we talked about things and I, I knew a little bit about the diary from that and uh, uh, was just aware that it was something that had been in his drawer. Um, and then he finally, against all odds, he kept pursuing how to get that back to that film. He never did meet the Ogawa family. So um, when we showed up, we were the first time that the Ogawas met anyone from the Mikesell family. Wow. Wow. Yeah, um, you brought up your dad, and I love learning about him because um, just hearing everyone speak about him, he just sounds like the kind of person that we should all strive to be. And, you know, the empathy, the humanitarian aspect of him, um, having kind of a larger sense of the world, um, even, you know, when you're when you're fighting in a war and um, just that that one moment to process and think to pick up the diary. And this, this could be important to somebody um, like that really change the tra trajectory of like a lot of people's paths and had a huge impact years, years down the road, which I think is amazing. Yeah, and um, it didn't necessarily, I agree with you totally. Um, and the fact that it was in a war uh, just happened to be the situation. And uh, early on as we we're making this film, people were saying, oh, it's, it's, it's a World War II story. And we're going like, no, 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 no. It, it could be anything. It, it's just whenever we have a monumental moment in life or just a crossroads where we can choose to exercise goodwill or turn our away and ignore it. Um, he was the type of person that would always try to exercise goodwill. So this was the largest example in his life that I could find. Um, and so it was a way of, uh, starting point was talking about his legacy and I thought well this is a launching point of who this guy was so. mm, absolutely yeah yeah I mean what a special man so thanks for sharing him with us <laughs> thanks for your um, kind words oh yeah um do you know if he ever I was curious if he do you know if he ever had the diary translated I mean he must have tried to find out the person's name and and that kind of thing he did and um uh, um there was uh not a complete uh, name, Ogawa was in there, but uh, he found out that Ogawa is a pretty common name. It, I wouldn't say quite Smith and Jones common in America. I would say it's more like the name Johnson. There's just, there's a lot of Ogawas in Japan. Um, but then what had happened after the total destruction of Japan, um, I think Osaka was the only city that wasn't really leveled. 
uh, people's records were all decimated, burned up, and uh, it was very difficult to find people after the war. Um, so he did have it translated, uh, not completely, but in, in the sense of trying to find out uh, the guy's name. And then uh, GE got it further translated after they were able to return it for him in 1958. And that's where he found out the last entry and things like that, what had really happened to this guy in, in uh, Hollandia, New Guinea. So. Oh. Um, so interesting. Um, and so, so years later, you have the diary, or they have the diary, but you're, you decided to take it to the next level. You decide to, you want to meet, meet and connect with the Agawa family, if, if at all possible. Yes. So can you kind of tell, tell us how, where did that urge come from? How did you decide, yes, this is what we're going to do, and how am I going to do it? <laughs> sure. Um, again, it was in uh, tracking my father's life and what it meant and things like that. But also my background is uh, as a writer and um, uh, have, you know, written and published short stories and novellas. And, but I came out of film school in Chicago also. So, uh, but my first love was always writing. So I'm easily grabbed by a story. And I thought, okay, well, he got this thing against all odds returned to this family in Japan. But what fully, as you mentioned, what was in the diary? What did it mean to them? And uh, is it something that they took great, great import from? Or did they just tuck it into a drawer, put it up in their attic and forget about it? So it was a matter of like, okay, what did it mean to them? And uh, is it, since my father never met them, is it possible to meet them now? And that was not only the starting point, but it was also a great unknown to us because we didn't know these people could, if we showed up on their doorstep, might uh, resent us because my father's forces killed their brother or son or whatever, um, or they might have been uh, totally boring and not interested. They may have been uh, not particularly nice people. We didn't know what we we're gonna walk into. So that was, what was lying out there is, is kind of our adventure, what we're going to find. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like um, a real link that made this all possible was uh, Professor Yoko McLean. And uh, yes. she's from University of Oregon. Shout out to Oregon. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, and that's kind of where this leads me to kind of another question, but where the kind of the synchronicity and sort of the trajectory of not just your father's legacy, but the story that you're living out kind of seems to have like almost it's a, a paved path to like this is, you know, all these little moments of um, happenstance and, you know, impossible odds, they all kind of happen to make it possible for you to actually connect with the Yagawas. Um, so I kind of leaped ahead there, but can you talk about a bit about Professor Yoko maybe and um, her key, her, her role in that? Sure. Um, and, and there was a ton of synchronicity. And um, we could talk about that a little bit later, if you'd like, because um, I think some of it is that things in the world or history itself is more interconnected than we may think. And if you just get out there and do a little bit of homework, you, you might be fine. What seemed like coincidences are kind of tied together at times. Uh, but anyway, so with this bizarre connection, uh, my wonderful wife, Len, who is also associate producer on the film, uh, had asked around, you know, because I was having trouble getting inroads into Japan, trying to f find the Agawa somehow, decades later. And uh, I mentioned it at a grade school at a Halloween parade. And uh, this friend that she knew said, just said, oh, my mom's roommate way back decades ago at the University of Oregon was Japanese. Maybe she could help. And she didn't even know who the roommate was or anything like that. And it turns out that her roommate was a uh, Yoko Matsuoko McLean, who was the daughter of Nasume Sasaki, a great novelist in, in Japanese literary history. Uh, and it was as simple as the film indicates. I emailed her, laid out the story, and she wrote back and said, it sounds like you're trying to emphasize goodwill and world peace, so count me in, how can I help? And it was that simple. It took, that, it took a while to find that connection, but when it hit, it just, the door opened. That's amazing. And can you kind of tell us what it was like the moment where you had a positive identi identification for um, the Agawa family? What was that like? It was, uh, I had worked hard enough and had sent enough emails and letters and everything like that. So when I got, the, I opened up my email one day and uh, Yoko said, bingo, we found him. You know, we, we got a reaction. Um, 
I just sort of sat back in my chair and just sort of like a little bit thunderstruck and you just exhale and you go, huh, I think it worked. <laughs> And were you guys, were you documenting at this point? Were you, were you starting to shoot some of the prep work that went into this? Uh, I was documenting in the sense that um, I uh, had gone to my, the last reunion of my father's 239th battalion and met some of his friends. And um, partly I wanted to meet them because I'd heard all about them. Um, and they took me in as honoring my my dad their old friend you know hey his kid showed up mm -hmm. uh and they were really open but then the other thing was that they um confirmed all the details that my father had told me and things that i documented found out from army records and stuff it was just everything was exactly the way it was recorded in battalion records but also in my father's memory which was great because as you know decades pass and sometimes people's memories can get faulty or a little foggy but everything was right on right and um and your father actually received a medal for this this good deed of returning the diary right like he uh he, he got um he actually got the bronze star he got a purple heart too for an injury in new guinea uh but then he, he got the uh, bronze star for publishing that newspaper that little ragtag newspaper he created okay. yes that out of the out of a tent he, he wasn't supposed to be you know in the military uh, press or anything like that. He just started going down and interviewing incoming ships and things like that, wherever he was stationed. He got the world news and he would put it in this, type it up and, and uh, make this little ragtag newspaper. And the, the men and women over their station there loved it because you know they didn't, weren't getting any news. And not only did they find out what was happening on other islands, they found out like, you know, who won the World Series back home or something like that. So uh, it took off and they gave him uh, a Jeep, a driver, uh, and his own little operation so he could continue. I've got, they're like, they're like little microfilm copies, of it, but I've got um, probably 40 or 50 issues of it, so. That's amazing, yeah. so interesting, yeah. wow. Um, so to kind of go back to um, starting filming the documentary, so once you found them and you connect, maybe you connect with them and plan you're making this trip, and so then you, you've got to pull together your, your documentary filmmaking team. So can you talk a little bit about that, like gearing up for an overseas shoot? Sure. Um, and through my different work in production and writing and things like that and different projects, the one lesson that I really learned early on that was really important is the, the best insurance against mediocrity uh, is to involve the best people you can find to work with you on a project. And uh, if it takes a little bit longer to find the right people, uh, and it's not always, you know, it might be somebody might be very talented, but you just wouldn't get along with them and things like that. So people that have a skill set that's what you're looking for up there, but you also get along with personally or they share a passion in the project. So um, uh, early on, I found Yoko and she was all in. And then Eddie Goodell is a, a great photographer up in Toronto, Canada, and I've been working as the editor and head writer of International Photography Magazine. And a year or two before I had interviewed Eddie for, um, I wanted to do a cover story on him. I was just searching out great photographers around the world. And I liked that he was a diamond in the rough. He, he was becoming well-known, but not quite. And uh, so it worked out great on that article. We became friends. Um, so I couldn't find the right cinematographer to work with or an, you know even like assistant director. And I thought, well, Eddie, you know, he's a photographer, but I'm going to call him. And um, I laid it out to him and he said, you know, it's really funny that you call because I'm just trying to figure out how to segue into filmmaking myself. And if you're willing to take a risk on me, um, uh, I'm all in too. And it was like, we were building this team where everybody was all in. So um, uh, that's how we found, that was the core group for uh, over in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, Yoko, my wife, Lynn, uh, our son Brady, who became the little ambassador, and, um, and Eddie Goodell from Toronto. Uh, that was the merry band that first flew over there. And um, we had done some homework and legwork up front so that we'd lined up some interviews. Yoko, of course, was a total angel because uh, she was very helpful and had connections there too, so. That's amazing. Um, and you talk about your son, how old was he when you, when you all went there? So you... He was, uh, I think he was like fifth grade. Wow. And so I, I love 
seeing like shots of him during this documentary because his eyes are always so open and big and taking everything in. And then um, when the Agawas and your family sit down for that dinner and he he kind of, it seems like he started the dinner with a speech. And yeah. I just like, for me that, I mean, that's when you kind of start to really feel that legacy coming you know, from your father to you, to, to your son and um, just bringing in that kind of generational family yeah. aspect it, it, for me it was so powerful and sweet and um and really impactful what, so what what was his experience as he talked about it like what was his takeaway from everything uh he yeah i think he he began a lifelong love affair with travel because of that and mm -hmm. uh uh since then you know you see us traveling around the subways and stuff in tokyo and and uh going down to hiroshima and things like that and he continues to this day uh like he uh, in Washington D.C., uh, he made a point of he wanted to go to every single subway spot and and not just get out, but he wanted to walk every neighborhood. So he he got this love lo uh, lifelong love of travel that's embedded in him. But he also had um, uh, for the short, for when he knew Dad before Dad passed away, he had a real link. Uh, a lot of people thought like there's. Uh, kind of spinning image of like Johnny and Brady from day one when dad held him in his arms and things like that there was just this bizarre like closeness right away and they were locking it on their eyes and that continued you know and so I think he bought right into oh this is cool I get to learn about grandpa's life and uh, I think much more so than I knew about my grandparents life because he was meeting all of these uh, friends and associates that we were interviewing through different chapters of dad's life. So he began at an early age, he was getting a, a cool, well-rounded 360 degree view of what his grandpa was like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, how long how, how long was the span of shooting this film? Uh, it, well, it was several years. I mean, in terms of uh, tracking down, I had to reconstruct what you know, dad's life was like and, and how it got this way. The film describes how you know, I was trying to figure out why he um, on the spot decided to do this act of goodwill. And uh, everybody I talked to was saying, oh yeah, that's Johnny, that's what he would have done. That, that doesn't surprise me at all. I'm going, yeah, okay, but why did, you know, not that many people would do such things. So uh, what was it about him? So I kept digging to find out what it was. And, and, and some of those things came through, you know, Jim Bird and people were saying, well, it's because he was a newsman. He had, uh, uh, a professional news person has a much more well-rounded view of things. He wasn't uh, totally um, subjective. You know, he wasn't, didn't buy into this anti-enemy. He didn't like, it's act, literally like, love thine enemy as yourself is basically what he did. And in the middle of harsh war conditions, that's kind of unusual. Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've got, I've had friends and things like that that fought in the Gulf War and uh, they didn't love their enemy. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is amazing. Um, and uh, so I, I, going back to that dinner, um, you see kind of generations of the Agawa family. And there was one woman, I believe it was, um, um, I'm forgetting the first name of the Agawa U that passed. Uh, Umako, the one in the beautiful dress. Yes, and she kept wiping her eyes. And um, I think somebody called this, getting this diary back, a miracle gift. Yes. Yeah. And so can the, you tell us? Oh, go ahead. No, the, the father that received the diary in 1958 yeah. referred to it as a miracle. In his letter to my father, he, wrote, he called it a miracle gift. Yes. Right. And so what do you feel? What was the feeling of being at that table with the generations of the Agawas and the generations of the Mikesels? Uh, what was that like? Um, again, even as they came down the stairs, uh, we hadn't met them. That was it. I mean, that was the first time we met. We didn't have any rehearsing before that luncheon at, at all. So that was the raw emotions. And uh, again, we didn't know what we were walking into. Uh, and it, I think it shows in the way we edited that it, it's a true edit, um, that there was a little, um, not standoffishness, but it was like everybody was feeling each other out a little bit. And uh, you didn't see the laughter coming into it until, you know, halfway through the meeting. And then by the time we're out in the garden for the group photo, everyone's jostling around like we've all known each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think to the casual viewer, there is some weight to that. That if you think about it, like, okay, so this guy's father's assignment was try to, to kill that family's sibling or, or 
And uh, it makes you wonder about who our enemies now are, are and what, how we're gonna feel about them hopefully a few decades later. And if there's just some better way we can not have to pick up guns every time we have a disagreement. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you actually got to hold the diary. Did they bring the diary to that dinner? Yes, and that was, and the, then, first, that was the first time I'd seen it. Yeah, uh, and so yeah. That, that must have kind of felt like a real like full circle connection to your dad a little bit. I'm Very okay. much so, yeah. And again, we, we'd been on the search, we'd been on the trail, we'd opened that door and gone down that path of history. And at, there's a couple points like you had mentioned before when we got, we found out we found the Agawas, uh, but this is another one when I actually held that and, and Lynn and I were, we'd gone through all of these steps to get there. And you just sort of like, for a minute, just a nanosecond, you exhale and go, oh, this mm -hmm. is, you know, this is what we were, looking for this is that all that work went into this moment so and you yeah. just stop for a second and appreciate the fact that it clicked yeah so that i mean there are so many again going to go back to this question but there are so many circumstances that had to unfold um to even get to this point meeting the gawa sitting down and, and almost becoming friends and sort of healing through connecting and this beautiful moment but it doesn't really stop there because then I, I forget, um, forgive me, because I forget how this connection was made, but the photographer Yoshito, I believe saw you, your family at Hiroshima and saw the way you left something at the shrine to honor yeah. the dead. And he kind of targeted you guys for a special mission. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, and there were a lot of um, moments of, you know, kismet or the, the coincidences that we couldn't even get all in the film because it would, they would become too many uh, little sidetracks. Mm -hmm. Like when I met Max Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, the only reason I recognized him was I just watched this uh, National Geographic documentary on finding um, Frank Ballard, the guy, the guy who found the Titanic, went over to look for John Kennedy's PT-109. He took a member of the Kennedy family with him who happened to be into scuba, scuba diving, Max. So I, I just watched that. And I, that's the only reason I looked up that morning and recognized who it was. And um, in fact, he told me later, he goes, the reason why I liked you or got along with you was you didn't come up to me and say, you're, Ro are you Robert? you're Robert Kennedy's son. You said, are you that guy in that Ballard film? And he goes, I really like that because you weren't like going Kennedy-esque on me. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah. And the, but the same thing on uh, Masushige was, because uh, I was trying to figure out how did this guy find us and I you know in the film it even says why us and we'd been to the um the National Peace Museum at Hiroshima that day with the ground zero for the a-bomb we'd left a note with the flowers and people in the museum had seen that but uh when you go to Hiroshima people come out of the woodwork if they find out you're working on a uh, world peace project and they just want to volunteer to help because they never want that to happen. What happened in Hiroshima in their hometown, they never want to happen anywhere else in the world. They're committed to that. So these two old guys uh, showed up and they introduced themselves and Yoko said, they're, they're here to help. They'll carry equipment. They just, they're just they gonna be our helpers today if you'd like. And I said, sure, well, you know. And then um, we had lunch halfway through the shooting that day. And I explained to these guys that in prep, prepping for this trip to Hiroshima, I'd stayed up real late the night before in, in the, the International House in Tokyo, had gone through a lot of research getting ready for the trip. And I found this article about these two little boys that were um, in Hiroshima. And uh, it was an article about what happened, how the city got wiped out. And it really hit me because the two boys in the picture were the same age as our son, Brady. And it made it very real all of a sudden. And I, I just really was affected and didn't even sleep well that night. But I said to the guys, you know, I, I equated some of the research and I mentioned that. And I said, I even made a Xerox here. I pull out my briefcase. I go, this is, these guys really got to me. And the guys go, oh, that's us. That's, that's me, that's me and my brother. I'm going, what? He go, yeah, yeah, that's us. We lived, we survived. You don't have to be, you don't have to cry. You're okay. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, what's that's, going on? <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. And so they're, they're, they're the guys that, through the museum uh, leadership, they're the ones who got to Yoshito Masushige and said, this American small film team is here and you really should talk to him because, you know, you want to, he was well, he was looking for someone to tell the story before he died, so, you know, even, minute by minute. Yeah. 
Yeah. And even his story was remarkable because he, what he had stopped home at home to use the restroom and that's yeah. when the bomb went off and he, it just kind of didn't blow yeah. that way. He, it went off at 8.15 or 8.16 in the morning. He'd been, uh, there was some news story during the night. He was off. He was a photographer for the newspaper. And he was heading back downtown. And he just stopped, you know, going by his house. And going, I'm going to use the bathroom. And he, he was in his house when the bomb hit. And that was outside of Ground Zero. So if he'd just been in the office, he, he would have, like everyone else, vaporized. And that would have been it for him. So. And then, I, yeah, that interview with him is so powerful, just saying he... He was kind of numb and then he just felt compelled to go out and shoot yeah. pictures. Yeah, and all that's direct quotes of what he said. He said, you know, my camera felt like it was 100 pounds and when I tried to lift it and he truly thought I shouldn't be doing this. People are dying. It's their private moments when they're passing on and I should not be. But the voice kept saying, no, you got to take the yeah. pictures. And so what was that like? I mean, this was kind of an unexpected connection that you made along your travels what what was that like um I mean can you ex explain kind of how that impacted you I guess yeah. personally and as a documentarian yeah it's what um probably the reason when we got back and you know time to edit the film and things like that that I I wrote that thing that I put on the front of the film you know if you knock on history's door it will answer and let you in there you will find the place where everyone lives again and it was uh I felt very much so, and so did Lynn, and so did Eddie and Yoko as we were traveling around, that we're, we'd made this effort to go down this path, but history was embracing us and opening doors for us. And it was, it's kind of inexplicable. We don't know why, it, we did our homework. We were working hard and uh, we weren't taking no for an answer at times, but um, we were being embraced by history in some way. I don't, I can't explain it, but it, felt exciting and it felt uh, like we were all part of something bigger than just our own lives. Yeah, and that gets back to that kind of kismet that, yeah. you know, kind of kind of like a charmed or blessed, you know, path, like, like it was, it was, you know, you worked really hard, but there was certainly things that just kind of unfolded naturally. And yeah, and there, yeah, I was down in Bradford doing research on my father's background. I stopped on the way out of town at the cemetery and I'll pay my respects to my my relatives that are in here and you know I, and I I'd learned about dad's work at George Blaisdell the guy who invented Zippo lighters you know he hired dad out of high school to be, be his first employee and things like that and I'd I'd been in that cemetery a couple of times before and I never noticed it I looked up and I crossed the way I saw George Blaisdell headstone and I thought oh man that's weird and so I I walked over there to pay my respects. And uh, I got this sense of like, you know, everything's gonna work out. And it turned out Zippo was one of our sponsors. And, uh, you know, I was down there researching. I had my camera with me. So, you know, I filmed George's headstone and things like that just to record it. And then I looked down and I realized um, I was standing on somebody else's grave. And um, it was the grave of the man who, when he was 16 years old, had uh, run over my dad's father and killed him. And so that's, you know, you're just thinking something's working here, something's odd. Oh my gosh. Does this, have you found the, these, these like happenings other places in your life as well? No, I'm not some bizarre <laughs> conduit, no, no. No, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I do like, you know, it's so fascinating on so many different levels, but um, one of the takeaways that I got from the film was that, um, you know, seeing your, it felt like a family story, like your family sort of became this channel for uh, for healing and connection and um, kind of just the power of remembrance and legacy and so many of those things that that kind of ground us in our lives. Um, and so then also, you know, taking that to the perspective of a viewer, how do you hope that they sort of, you know, take this in for themselves and what can they learn from it? What is your hope? Yeah, um, good question. And uh, really interesting because when people were making the film, they were saying things like, well, what's what do you want people to take away from it? and things like that? And I said, well, beyond the, the story, um, I'd really like people as they're watching it to think, hey, uh, what's in my attic or what's in my basement? What's in my filing cabinet? 
And uh, how can I knock on history's door and get access to something larger than myself? And you know, what, what do I even have around my environment that um, is of value to other people? And sure enough, that's what a lot of people have come back and said to us is that, you know, it really made them think about trying to not just family history, but to see if there's just some outreaches from um, their experiences or um, material goods around their house that tie into other subjects. And so um, that in its own way was one of the side intents of, of to point out how easily accessible history can be if you open your eyes and think about it and pursue. One of um, my favorite quotes from the film, which I wrote down, I believe it's the photographer Yoshito, but it goes something like, uh, the quiet voice we can hardly hear is what we should listen to, to do the few things that we are really here to do. And that might be, might have gotten some words wrong there, but no, that was it. another takeaway for me because it really, you know, those little decision, decisions you make along the way, like your father picking up that diary and following through with delivering at home, or, you know, when we leave our front doors at our homes and start the day, there's always, there could potentially be those moments where you really impact history, you impact somebody's life. Um, and so that was certainly like one of my favorite takeaways from this film. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, oh, neat. And um, yeah, and I think it, that's sort of uh, an outgrowth of, we mentioned how my dad uh, just happened to be a person who believed in following through on your good intentions. We all have, maybe it's that little voice or whatever. We all say, hey, I should, should really do that. I should, you know. And there are things that um, we should listen to ourselves and go, yeah, I really should. And you know what, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, and it, that the, the hearing the photographer speak, he reminded me of your father, who obviously I didn't know, but like from from what you've shared about him, it sounds like it's you know, they would have been friends. Like they both had this these perspectives that um, that were bigger than themselves, and um, you know. And it's interesting, your... interesting that they both were uh, news professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, it, going into the war, my dad was working in the newspaper business, and Yoshito Masushige was the newspaper photographer. And like you say, uh, they're thinking about uh, a world larger than their own lives because that's what their outlook is. That's what their job is too. Yeah, no, and it's it's such a good reminder because, like, I think we can all get kind of tunnel vision into our daily lives, our tasks, our jobs, all that. And yeah, this one. When uh, back, you know, when we're all 1920, at the peak of our idealism, perhaps, you know, and uh, uh, I remember, you know, yelping to my dad about how I was, I was going to change the world, and you know, his, we're my my generation was going to do things different than his generation, but you know, I was going to change the world, and he goes. You don't, that's not a big thing. You don't have to go like redefine yourself. You can go out tomorrow morning and uh, say hello and talk to some uh, lonely person. You can, if somebody's got a flat tire on the side of the road and help them change it, you know, you, you can change the world in any given day with any single sort of uh, gesture, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, that, I mean, it's like one of the greatest lessons we can all keep telling ourselves, reminding ourselves of, for sure. Yep, I agree. <laughs> Well, um, again, I want to thank you so much for sharing this story, sharing your time and talking with us. Um, any final words, any, any, um, any news about the film? Is it being distributed? Are you guys working on that? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's being uh, PBS, it's, it's being distributed and it's available to any PBS station. And uh, awesome. the last uh, carriage report we received, it's played in 41 states and it's played in Puerto Rico and uh district of columbia and then the interesting thing is um when it plays across the northern border like in maine northern new york uh, minnesota idaho um, state of washington it bleeds across the line of course into canada and um so we we, we get a lot of emails from canadians <laughs> and i don't but they're really into it. So um, they've reacted very much to that sort of message of international goodwill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, like that's another question. What what have what feedback have you gotten? Have you gotten just inundated with people out with questions, ideas? 
Yeah, and, and it falls into different camps. Uh, one of them, you know, it will be the people take on a personal level and say, oh, uh, my mom was a nurse in New Guinea and or, or my dad served there and, and uh, I wish he or she could have seen the story or um, uh, makes really makes me feel like you honored all of these other people too just by bringing up what they did. So that's, that's really heartwarming. Uh, and then uh, there are, is the camp where people are saying, you've inspired me to think about history in a different way and what maybe I can tap into. And I'm thinking about that. Um, and then there's also um, quite a few people have said um, it's the kind of story that um, makes me have more faith in humankind than I've had lately. I think we've been th through such a tough four or five years of things and so many people are torn apart or criticizing each other and things like that, that uh, it, 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 in a nice, really nice, unexpected way, uh, people are saying it gives pause and, and good faith again in humanity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Um, what's next for you? Do you, I know you're a writer, you're, you, <laughs> you write in many different genres. Uh, uh, so what's next for you? Um, we're working on something and I'm working with Anthony DeLuca, who was the editor, again, uh, found the right person to work with. And we share the same kind of passions and things like that and outlooks. And he was great to work with as the editor on this film. We really, really dove into it. Um, and then um, specifically, uh, I won't get into exactly, but I've been knocked out a bit because uh, um, while some filmmakers I could hunker down during the pandemic and 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 be doing stuff at home and, and actually being productive that way uh, our idea also entailed a lot of uh travel and work in canada and so we just haven't been able just until recently just opening up now so um that has put a slowdown and so that'll be our next uh assignment well is there any place people can follow you are you um social media set up uh yeah um we have um uh Good Twitter following. Um, um, unearthingogawa.com is the website, but on Twitter. And then there's also a Facebook. Uh, I know, you know, Facebook is becoming less, but um, there's a Facebook page also. And so we've tried to uh, notify uh, people about when the, it's airing or if it's, um, I think it's going to be playing in a festival in Australia next month and things like that. Um, okay. And uh, they've been really receptive down there. So, um, have you been able to go with the film to any in-person festivals and see the audience reaction? Um, once in New York uh, uh, last month, and because uh, you know, everything, and then uh, even the ones that we're trying and thinking that oh, we're going to go physical, we're going to go back being a physical festival, have had to, because of the uptick late summer and September. You know, have gone online virtual. So mm -hmm. um, now we haven't. And that was the only time where we sat in a theater and watched people watching it. So that was interesting. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Well, at least you've got, I'm glad you've gotten at least one experience like that. <laughs> yeah. And then um, hopefully if something clicks on another, this next project, hopefully we'll get out and meet you guys all personally. Yeah. We've loved working with everyone at Portland. You guys are great. Well, we would love to have you. Um, we always call ourselves kind of a festival family. And so you're a part of the festival family now. So if you're ever shooting in Portland, you need crew, call us. If you ever need anything in Portland, call us. <laughs> oh, wow. Now that's a good invitation. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. And you're going to provide a free crew. Wow. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. We'll connect yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. So then the, the crew will want to get paid. Okay. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have unions up here. It's, it's you know, we got to. No, but, but, uh, but, yeah, but we, yeah. And, uh, and way back when my, Grant, my grandfather on one side was born in Ashland, Oregon, and, oh, wow. uh, and uh, had connection out there in, in Ashland where they actually had a, um, a woolen mill out there too. Uh, they, it's they, beautiful. Ashland's gorgeous. I, I've been to Medford and been Eugene and Portland. I've never been specific to Ashland, but, um, but everybody at your festival has been wonderful to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so you're one of our favorite places. Well, thanks for saying that. We really appreciate it. We try, and um, honestly, it's it's moments like these that we get to share with with our team and with the people watching that really mean so much. So, thank you so much, um, Steve, for joining us. Okay, Jen, we really appreciate it, and uh, good luck with the rest of the festival. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be tuning in. 
Awesome. And be sure to check out anybody watching, be sure to check out Unearthing Agawa at pdxff.com and be sure to vote after you watch it. Um, all the films you can vote on for um, best short documentary, this one for short documentary. All right. Well, thank you, Steve. All right, Jen. Take Talk good care. Bye-bye.